All right, thank you. Um, I would like to just start off by saying that this is a natural progression from uh, what Les Lee uh, just presented in terms of mechanics of materials uh, moving into uh, the structural mechanics. And, and actually, a lot of the PIs that are in uh, Les's portfolio or they have migrated through Les's portfolio have made their way into my portfolio as they move from the material systems up to the structural systems. So I think that's a, a very good collaboration and a partnership that we have uh, that we continue to do in the future. So uh, my program is Multiscale Structural Mechanics and Prognosis. Uh, this is probably, I'm getting close to four years now here at AFOSR, so I'm, I'm finally trying to, to get my, uh, my feet on the ground and understand where this portfolio is going. Um, okay, so the, the required chart, uh, we do flight structures, uh, fundamental basic research into structural mechanics problems relevant to the U.S. Air Force. Uh, my sub areas are listed below, novel flight structures, multi-scale modeling, prognosis, and structural dynamics. But if anybody has been to one of my program reviews, uh, they get the understanding that my area is extremely broad. There's, there's a lot of things that are covered within my portfolio. And we've struggled with that over the last couple of years in terms of, of finding a focus and a vision um, for this area. So we, we, we've, we've, over the last couple of years, we, we finally got a vision uh, laid out, uh, and now we're trying to, to put some refined focus on that. So to help do that, I had to go back to some basics and went back and looked at some of the definitions for structural mechanics. Uh, so from our, our knowledge source, Wikipedia, uh, structural mechanics, uh, we're talking about the computation of deformations, deflections, internal forces and stresses uh, within structures either for design or performance evaluation. So I looked at this for quite a while in trying to understand what I should be focusing on within these sub areas in my portfolio. And a couple of the key areas that came out, uh, we're doing computation. So one thing I have to do is computing within my portfolio. We're looking at performance evaluation. So that, that turns into predicting for my portfolio. And then we also do design, not, not really traditional design, but in my aspect, I, I consider that enabling. So we're looking at things that will enable the future design of, of aircraft structure. Uh, so, so that's kind of what we've, I've kind of highlighted for my focus within these sub areas. So the three things that I'm looking to do are computing, predicting, and enabling. So what I'm hoping to accomplish within this forum is not to go over what has been in the portfolio in the past, but kind of lay the groundwork for where we're going in the future, highlight some of the areas that we're really excited about, um, and, and, and generate some, some excitement for the structural mechanics community and, and reinvigorate some of the, the basic research in this area. So we've seen this uh, the last couple of years, my three thrust areas and the various um, activities that, that fall within the thrust area. So in novel flight structures, we do the morphing aircraft, flapping wing vehicles, any other types of non-traditional structural configurations. Uh, within structural dynamics, we're looking at, at combined response uh, you know, for structures, so thermoacoustic, mechanical, um, things that, that, that are, are happening in other portfolios that, that require combined environments to, to achieve their, their goals, uh, including space structures. And then probably the largest uh, area of my portfolio is in multi-scale modeling and prognosis, where we house all of the work on structural health monitoring, non-destructive evaluation, the prognosis, or, or really the, the predicting of, of how material and structure evolve over time based on, on loads, uh, and then incorporating a lot more of the physics-based modeling um, into this arena. Uh, yeah, so that's good. Uh, within those, those areas, we've identified several key challenges that, that we're trying to overcome. Uh, I won't read all of them, but the, they, they typically fall along the lines of um, trying to encompass uncertainty and variability in our systems, how we can, can improve probability of detection as we, as we go to our next generation health monitoring, non structure evaluation, uh, verification and validation is a, is a key issue, especially as we move to these physics-based models. How do we verify and validate that the models uh, represent what we actually see? Uh, and then, uh, as we the, incorporating the, the multi-scale aspect of my portfolio, how do we handle the time and length couplings um, in, in these different model schemes? On the structural dynamics, uh, we really talk about computational cost when we try to do these combined environments. Uh, traditionally. Uh, we've done these analysis 
you know, singularly. So we'll do a CFD analysis, we'll do a, a, a thermal analysis, we'll do a, a structural analysis. Uh, what happens in terms of computational costs when we try to bring all of these types of analysis together under one framework? Uh, taking into account the nonlinear actions that occur when we do that, uh, and then trying to, to represent the testing environments um, that we can't accurately represent on the ground. You know, we, we can't really test the environments that these structures are going to see. So how can we, how can we make sure that we are capturing that? Uh, and that goes back to the verification and validation side of things. Uh, these are a lot of challenges. Uh, we're not trying to accomplish them all on our own. We have a lot of, of outside collaborations, uh, in particular with, uh, with NASA, uh, ARO, Dave Stepp uh, is here in, in the audience as well as some of his uh, program managers. We work very closely with, with that group. Uh, working with the group in ONR mostly on the health monitoring aspects. Uh, so Ignacio and Li Ming uh, do a lot of the, the health monitoring for ONR. Uh, some of the, the new areas that we're working right now are in collaboration with NSF. I'll talk a little bit about that later and I failed to, to include a name here. We have a, a new program manager at NSF, Marty Dunn, who is also uh, very closely aligned with my portfolio. Uh, also with, with Ditress, I'll sue in the audience as well. Uh, and then even within uh, AFOSR, we have a lot of collaboration. So a lot of those challenges uh, have a lot of underpinning in, in mathematics. So I work very closely with, uh, with Fariba Fru, uh, follow her Muri on uncertainty because that, that's a key issue in terms of this multi-scale modeling is how can we um, move uncertainty through these various models along the different scales. Uh, so we work very close together. I have a lot of interactions with our international um, components, uh, there, there's a lot of good work, especially on the computational science side uh, across the international arena. So I have a lot, of, a lot of good interactions there, even though I may not visit them all at the same time. Uh, we will get that accomplished, Jim, sometime in the, in the near future. Uh, and then some of the, the new areas that we're doing uh, in, in terms of transformational computing and looking at, at hybrid structures. All right, so this is, this is the chart that we've been using as our vision, trying to, to focus the community on a, a vision for the future of structural mechanics. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's not normal because this vision has actually caught on a lot more rapidly than we ever expected. So, so our vision has gone viral. Uh, it's been picked up by um, several other agencies. Uh, several, some of the laboratories are, are, are now on board with, with this vision. Um, I'm seeing it everywhere now in terms of academics. When we go to conferences, people that I've never met, there'll be digital twin titles in all of the, all of the charts. Uh, we have a special session this year at AIAA SDM on the digital twin. So if you're uh, participating in that conference, please stop by and, and see what we're talking about as we go forward. Uh, but just a quick summary, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. What we were talking about is that, that in today's environment, we, we have a lot of computer-aided engineering for handling our structural analysis capabilities. But typically, we use single models to represent the entire fleet. And we know that no two aircraft come off the line the same. There, there's so many material variabilities, manufacturing variabilities, uncertainties that go into this process that, that we're really averaging out all of those errors. So what we're looking at for the future is moving towards this serialized digital twin capability where each model is specifically tailored to the aircraft um, as it comes off the line. Um, and so that's, that's, uh, that's a, a very daunting task. Um, we can do this at, at various scales as well. It doesn't have to be the entire aircraft. There are some people that are doing this now on individual components. Um, but that's the vision that, that we've laid forward and it's been picked up uh, pretty well throughout the community. Uh, so this is uh, the words that go with that chart. So uh, being able to uh, enable real-time, high-fidelity operational decisions, that's, that's the real key. We, there's no need to do any of these things if we can't make decisions based on, on what we see, enabled by, by the tail number, uh, health awareness. And this is, this is actually the, the word chart that the AFRL group has put together to um, espouse their version of, of what they're doing in terms of the, of the digital twin. So we're talking about you know, flying these things virtually. How can, we, how can we forward fly our models to get a better understanding of, of what type of damage or what type of performance capability we have? Um, this integrated um, feedback loop between modeling, sensor readings, uh, in terms of validation, verification, 
updating, uh, that, that's, that's very key and I think is, is one of the, 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 the biggest basic research areas in terms of how we, how we accomplish this. Uh, and then, then moving forward. So being able to understand when and where structural damage occurs or where it's likely to occur and then moving away from our scheduled based uh, maintenance that we do today and get to a, an actual when maintenance is needed understanding. All right. So uh, two years ago when we started uh, this vision, we, we went out and surveyed the community. We, we did a workshop to try to bring um, a, a lot of the leaders in the field together to, to lay out what some of the, the challenges are, especially from the basic research standpoint. Uh, and these were some of the, the key workshop recommendations and I think they highlight some of the, the areas that we're, we're starting to focus on within our, um, not necessarily my own portfolio, but within portfolios within AFRL um, and AFOSR. So material scale modeling, you know, understanding how we do these high fidelity 3D microstructures um, of heterogeneous material uh, and then in terms of doing the scaling, you know, being able to homogenize some of those results um, in, in terms of understanding what the mechanics are uh, of those models because we, 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 we have a, a big problem in terms of computational capability in doing this high fidelity 3D microstructure. So we have to rely on, on reduced order models and homogenization to accomplish any type of um, uh, result that we want to see. Moving uh, um, into deterministic multi-scale modeling, uh, so we're really looking at, at building this computational environment that has the flexibility to take into account all of this mathematics and physics across these different domains, uh, the upscaling and downscaling strategies, uh, and then another key area is this uncertainty quantification. How do we propagate error through all of those different analysis capabilities? Uh, definitely moving towards a more probabilistic uh, capability within our, um, within our modeling uh, arena. All right, so we talked about this being picked up by several other organizations. This is actually the roadmap that AFRL, Air Vehicles Directorate, is using for their digital twin. Uh, they have uh, engaged industry. Uh, industry has participated in, in several of this. We just had a workshop uh, last month uh, at Wright-Patterson on the digital twin uh, applied research side. So what, what type of spirals they're looking at, at, at getting into. It ties in the Materials and Manufacturing Directorate's new uh, visions for integrated computational material science and engineering. That ties in, you can see they, they've acknowledged the, the Manufacturing Directorate, what we're doing within AFOSR uh, and what other directors are doing in terms of trying to lay out a coordinated roadmap for this vision. Uh, in keeping with that, my job is to distill what the basic research challenges are associated with this, with this roadmap. Um, and, and in doing so, we've, we've uh, put together a partnership with NASA um, to try to, to lay out what our uh, common vision uh, along these future capabilities are. So we have a Space Act agreement with NASA right now to develop this area, uh, and we're really looking at trying to develop a, a national roadmap for how we can accomplish some of these things in terms of a, of a digital twin. So some of the planned capabilities that, that we've been talking about are, are you know, what, how would we do this for, for as we move forward into, into hypersonics or hypersonic strategic bombers, long durations, reconnaissance vehicles, and autonomous space vehicles. So those were kind of the, the common areas that overlapped what NASA's goals were as well as what the Air Force goals are. And then we had some shared technical challenges as well in terms of, of understanding computational damage mechanics. They're still interested in, in, in structural health uh, management. Uh, this couples with the computational, the, the verification validation, we still have to do experimental damage mechanics uh, across various levels. And then as we move more into this risk-based design for these, these, cap these fleet vehicles that we won't be able to fully test before we actually try to field them. So we have to get into a better understanding of how we do this from a risk-based design capability. Uh, so this is, uh, as part of the, the effort with NASA, we've put together a timeline for what we're trying to accomplish. We're still very early on. We're, we're still in the organization stage. We, this roadmap is a, a work in progress. So we're, we want to engage the community and, and invite some, some feedback and some input into where we're going. Uh, we have done a little bit of the education in terms of going out and talking. 
We've put together this framework for how we want to organize, and we're, we're right here now in terms of refining these thrust areas and establishing this database. Uh, and then hopefully later this year, we'll move into uh, the utilization side. So just a, a quick eye chart on one of the, the draft things that we're doing in terms of our, our technical areas. Uh, so we've kind of laid out what some of the challenges are or, or things that we would like to achieve in the near term, mid term, and far term. Everything from atomistics and, and, and crystal plasticity all the way up through, you know, through inductor dynamics. So it has the multi-scale aspects um, and all the way down to when we get to, to real far term, you know, these virtual experiments in real time and 3D, those really tie in with the digital twin. Um, and then I'll just highlight one thing. So, so computation is key in this. So, so right now, you know, everybody's moving to this GPU architecture. We're doing um, HPC, you know, high performance computing. Um, even, even within our own community, we're starting to look at, at how quantum computing could, could play into that arena. So just want to talk a, a little bit about that. Um, so we highlighted uh, the DDRD uh, basic research areas where it came out, I think, uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, and one of the key ones kind of resonated with us uh, in terms of quantum information science, you know, being able to, to use new algorithms that, that fully exploit uh, quantum information science for new capabilities. Uh, and given that, um, our director actually gave us the charge to, to go out and look at how we could do transformational computing within the aerospace science and the engineering community. So my colleague Doug Smith and I um, sat down over, over several months to try to really understand what that actually meant for us. What, what does transformational computing for the aerospace science and engineering group actually mean? Um, and it really came down to, you know, we have this, this it's, a, it's a multidisciplinary approach that involves novel architectures, software, and, and algorithms. We put a focus on, on our, you know, we, we all have self-serving mechanisms, so we put an emphasis on our particular program areas, but we really didn't want to limit um, the responses that came back from the community. So we were, we were considering several different types of of transformational computing endeavors. Um, but when we actually decided that we were going forward with the program, we knew that we had to focus um, because we couldn't have proposals that came in across the gamut. So in, in consultation with, uh, which is, is our words for actually talk to some really smart people, uh, we, we talked to, to Tatiana and Fariba and, and John Lucasland about some of these areas. And we really thought that the quantum-based system is the one area that provided the highest potential payoff for, for our community. Um, we don't want to, uh, what we were trying to accomplish was bringing our aerospace community together with the quantum community together before the architecture has been finalized. Um, typically that's what we, we see as, as new computational architectures emerge is that we'll take our algorithms and, and try to retrofit them to run properly on those systems as opposed to the um, coordinated effort to understand how those algorithms, how those systems work, and how they can best be exploited um, for the algorithms that, that we need to run in, in the aerospace science. So it's really a bringing the two communities together so they can start talking, because nobody in our communities were actually thinking about quantum computing at this time. So, so that, that's a, a audacious da uh, task for us, and, uh, but we're very excited. So we actually have two grants that were, uh, I think they were just recently awarded um, in this area. Uh, one at uh, UC San Diego and one at, at Pitt, and I think Doug uh, Smith may have talked about this during his briefing. Um, but I just want to highlight, so, so we actually, we asked them, you know, we want to be able to exploit these architectures for aerospace computing. And uh, I think you see the representative team disciplines they highlight the, the multidisciplinary nature uh, of, of what we're trying to accomplish. So we have groups from mathematics and computational science and, and mechanical and aerospace engineering and people that are doing the quantum theory and quantum hardware um, brought together on a single team. And I think that's going to enable us to really um, create something transformational within the aerospace science community. So I won't talk about, about their approaches. I think Doug talked about those during his talk. All right, so that's, that's the, the long, long, long term, you know, 30 years from now, what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, back to the vision and, and some things that we're trying to do a little closer to today, 
uh, one of the, the lab tasks that we have with Air Vehicles Directorate, so we talked about this being able to forecast um, aircraft usage and, and forward fly some of these models. Uh, that, that really means that we have to be able to understand how we incorporate usage um, into our models and how do we predict, you know, how do we capture all the variability in the usage in, in, in the CFD models and how we translate that into FDA simulations. So one of the groups within, uh, within RB, Ben Smarslock, Eric Teagle, and Ravi Penmetza are really looking at um, how, how the material states evolve um, and, and, and really base this on the realistic loading environmental sequences. So how can we, um, how can we move beyond this understanding using a single structural load parameter history and, and really get into the, 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 the probabilistic aspect of, of a, an, an uncertain loading environment. Uh, so, so they are in, I think, their first year of this. Uh, they're making some, some very good headway in terms of bridging, uh, mapping CFD simulations onto FEA simulations, uh, but the real work is, is in here and is capturing these, these usage parameters. Uh, in combination with that, one of the, the, a couple of the groups within my portfolio at the, on the academic side are looking at this Bayesian updating techniques for, for, for design. So it's really to, to help capture this uncertainty quantification in our system. So again, we're talking about frameworks, so how we can, how we can propagate um, some of this information. Fariba's group uh, on the Muri on uncertainty is really doing a lot of the, the background work on the, the theory and the information theoretics associated with how we measure uncertainty and how we quantify uncertainty. Um, my group is looking at, at how we're going to actually do this in terms of a methodology. How do we incorporate information uncertainty, physical variability, and model uncertainty into the models that we currently have and propagate them all the way to the point where we can do some verification and validation. Uh, so this is, this is the work of, of two different individuals, one at Youngmin Liu at Clarkson University and Mike Todd um, at UC San Diego. Uh, but here's what we're talking about in terms of the ideal future. You know, we have completely known physics with no uncertainty. That's, that's an audacious goal right there. Uh, and, but in order to do that, we're going to need a much, much, much greater computational uh, capacity, which is why I think some of the, the quantum, the transformational computing arena is going to be key in where we go in the future. All right, so I'm going to spend my last 10 minutes or so uh, talking about another area um, away from, from that, that vision of digital twin, but in terms of one of the, the concepts that we talked about in terms of computing, predicting, and enabling are, are these enabling methodologies. And, and one of the things that we're trying to achieve within several different programs is the ability to do this radical change. Uh, so we're talking about doing large motions, uh, you know, being able to do shape change. How do we actuate those types of shape changes along different areas? So, so I'm interested in, in morphing, Doug Smith has some stuff in, in active flow control and active membranes. And then I have a group um, out of space vehicles that, that's interested in, in deployment of, of antenna arrays or sensor arrays um, in space. So I talked about this a couple of years ago. This is actually in their third year. They're finishing up. But uh, since we're streaming, I wanted to, to revisit this and, uh, because it's a very exciting area. Uh, one of the groups at University of Michigan, uh, Diane Bry, is looking at active knits for a radical change. Uh, and I think a couple of years ago I told people I, I had no idea that I would be funding knitting within the structural mechanics group, but I know what knit one, pearl two means now. I understand, you know, what, what that means in terms of, of how the, the actual structure of the, the knit uh, affects actuation. So what they're doing um, is really trying to understand how we can create different types of shape change just based on how we fabricate this material or how we, how we put this material together. Um, so they, they've gone through several different types of um, uh, analytical studies, um, computational studies to put together this understanding of, of how the structural aspects of the, the wires create different actuation mechanisms. So if you see across the top, we, they're, they're able to do things like contraction, um, rolling, twisting, accordion, arching. But the key thing is this is all using the, the same material. 
same material system. Just how, how they, they put the nits together creates different actuation mechanisms. So in terms of contraction, they're able to, um, just by thermally activating this material, um, they create this type of contraction. They can get it to roll up, which I think is, is, could be a key area for some of the stuff we're talking about in terms of space deployment of antennas. Uh, twisting. An accordion type shape folding up and then even be able to, to make our, our materials arch. So uh, they, they've done a lot of work there. Uh, they still have a lot of work to do because I don't think in our Air Force CONOPS we, we're going to plan on having a, a graduate student with a hair dryer um, actuate our, our structure. So uh, we're, we're going to be, uh, be moving forward to see how we can actually encapsulate some of this stuff uh, and, and make this more automated uh, so that we can do this electrically as well. Uh, but that's some of the stuff that they've been doing in terms of the, the, the real uh, analytical aspects. So, so they're really getting into what are the geometric relationships, how does the force equilibrium happen, uh, and, and how does this really get down to uh, the actuation? How can we predict what the actuation displacements are going to be beforehand? So it's real small down here, but you know, in terms of what I think the novelty of this approach is, is that they're, they're taking into account these operational transitions these friction, the, the friction associated with the, the wires rubbing together, the load paths, and then this is key in terms of, of bridging in these, these active materials. So I was real excited to see some of Les's stuff when he's talking about uh, Ray Bauman's work on carbon um, yarns. You know, this, this can, can have effect at different scales as well. Once we get into manufacturing at the nanoscale level, understanding how we actually put those yarns together could give us capabilities that, that we don't currently have in terms of actuating materials and structure. All right, so over the last year, they, they, they did a lot of that, um, uh, you know, understanding of, of what's going on, and now they're actually trying to look at some real applications of how they could do that. One of the areas they looked at is, is in the flow control area uh, in terms of being able to, to change the effective shape of the wing mid-flight. So, so they actually looked at what type of, of, of structural configuration they would have to put together in order to achieve some of the things they need to do for flow control. So the one that they settled on was a rib stick architecture. So you can see what it, what it would look like in a traditional um, uh, yarn structure. So you have these knit columns and these pearl columns that are alternated. Uh, and this is, this is the difference. So, so you'll have the ridges either on the front of the structure or the ridges at the rear of the structure. So that's how they've done the, the SMA wire uh, actuation. And then they're starting to try to understand the operational mechanisms here in terms of what happens in the Martin site compressed state and what happens in the, in the expanded state. Uh, and then to, to couple that and try to understand what the actual actuation mechanism is. So they've actually created the prototype for this. Uh, that's what their uh, rib stitch looks like. Uh, and they started doing some of the testing to help validate uh, their analytical models in terms of, of uh, this, this cycle of Austin Titan Martin site uh, actuation. So we've got one video of, of what they're doing, so you can see what they're, they're able to do in terms of shape change for, for this particular structure. All right, so, so that's one area uh, that I'm interested in. Uh, another area that, that we are starting to, um, to look at, and again, I saw this within uh, Les's portfolio when he started talking about some of the cellular-based compliant materials, uh, there, there's a renewed interest in compliant mechanisms as well in terms of how we can achieve some of this, this actuation using compliance in our structure. Uh, so those are just some, some pretty pictures. Uh, we also uh, had this in our portfolio several years ago uh, in terms of we were looking at, at morphing structure uh, and trying to increase lift and agility passively, uh, and they're really doing this using a compliant spline that's inserted into the wing spar uh, that, that takes into account the nonlinear stiffness during the upstroke and downstroke of the wing uh, and, and the ability to create this uh, what they call it, the, uh, the, the CVG, the continuous vortex gate, which is the, the twisting and, and turning of the, of the avian wing as it goes through its, its segment of flight. So by putting in this compliance spline, which is passive, there, there's no actuation mechanism being input into the system, 
they've been able to get a 300% net lift increase just by including this, this passive mechanism. Uh, so so I, in, in terms of reducing the energy requirements to achieve some of this, this flapping wing flight, I think this is a, is a, is a key development. Uh, the problem is uh, a lot of this development is trial and error right now. There, there aren't very many design tools uh, to really understand how you insert these compliant mechanisms into your structure to achieve the, 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 the insight or achieve the, the objectives that you're trying to get uh, in terms of the increased range and endurance. Uh, this was optimized for steady flight. Um, we don't always do steady flight, so, so how do we handle multiple flight regimes as well? Uh, so as a result of that, uh, we're going to have a workshop. Uh, this is an advertisement. Uh, March 26th and 27th uh, at Wright-Patterson, looking at compliant mechanisms, uh, not necessarily just for microair vehicle design, but compliant mechanisms for design in general. Um, so we're bringing together a lot of the leaders in the community to come talk about you know, methodology and design synthesis, um, how we do passive shape change, and a lot of the other areas in terms of, of compliant materials and how we maybe embed that with SPART adaptive structure as well so that we can actuate um, these materials. Uh, so that's coming up. I'll have to apologize to James Yu if he gets a, a overwhelming uh, response now for this, but uh, that's planned for March 26th and 27th uh, in Dayton. And one last um, thing to highlight, so uh, they even talk about origami uh, as part of this, this compliant mechanism, uh, and that, that feeds into one of the last areas that, that I want to talk about that I'm really excited about um, is this uh, a partnership that we have with the National Science Foundation uh, and their EFRI program uh, on origami design for self-assembling systems for engineering uh, innovation. So, so we're working collaboratively with them to, um, to really to bring this to fruition. Uh, combine understanding and active materials and design theory, the mathematics, and then because it's origami, yes, we're interested in some of the artistic inspiration as well uh, to enable this adaptive morphing system. Uh, this is an ongoing program. Uh, the NSF call just recently closed. They have proposals in hand that are, that are being evaluated that, that we will co-fund. Um, but we also have an AFOSR BAA on the origami system that's still open. So um, if there are people in the community that are interested, that have some novel ideas, we are currently accepting white papers uh, for this particular area up through, I think, May. Um, so, so if you're interested, please uh, contact one of us, uh, either Fariba Joycelyn, Doug Smith, or I, uh, who are the AFOSR collaborators on this origami initiative. And these are the, the required elements that we're looking for. You know, so it's, it's development uh, of scientific, mathematical, uh, or design theories for, for folding and unfolding self-assembly at, at, at and across scales, and then you know, these tools to facilitate design of these systems, because I think that's, that's another key area, is, is being able to design these systems beforehand without going through the trial and error um, that we have seen in the past. Uh, so that's, that's uh, I think that's all I have. Um, so we've, we've, over the last couple of years, we've kind of focused down to three core thrusts, focused on this digital twin vision. Um, I've been able to, over some, some soul searching and, and understanding of, of where I want the program to go, to kind of focus on the core concepts of structural mechanics. We're, we're really looking at, at computing, predicting, and enabling. Um, we're coordinated uh, across various government agencies and, and within AFOSR, and we have some, some very exciting uh, new transformational capabilities that I think will be coming uh, over the next several years. And with that, I'll take any questions. Questions or comments? Thank you very much, very exciting stuff. On your challenges slide, you talked a little bit about one of the challenges for uh, uh, aircraft uh, sis, uh, systems and all was uh, student education. Could you talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, um, so I think the, the, the mindset there was as we move to 
these non-traditional structural configurations, um, the, the traditional education in those arenas are on tube and wing type structures um, historically. So, so how do we evolve that to be more multidisciplinary, uh, to take into account some of the, the um, new design optimization tools uh, that are available? Uh, so so we, we've been talking about doing some, uh, some attempts to change some of the curriculum at some of the universities in terms of design education uh, and, and try to put out some, some programs for, um, so we have a lot of design, um, so we have like, like flight efforts that the students go through. So most of the design challenges that they do are unfunded, you know, volunteer-led efforts. So you have the design, build, fly type efforts, things like that. Um, we, were, we were thinking about doing something similar to what we're doing on like the NanoSat um, initiative, some capstone um, design uh, where, where the, the professors can come in and, and, and talk about the entirety of, of, of how we change design education within the system. So we haven't made much um, headway in that arena, but it's still an area of interest, especially as we get to this multidisciplinary design optimization uh, capability. So we're going to continue to push that. Yeah. Thank you.